Okay, so my uh, console, now that we've started to add data to the database, it's not simply just going to say object. It's actually then going to show you some quick information. Doc count. There's two documents so far. Update sequence. I've updated it twice. Binary, the name of the database. STC class. That's the same information as if I open up that little that little um, triangle. But anyway, the the um, the big idea is that if we look inside of resources in the in Chrome, look in resources index DB pouch SDC e classes, different ways to look at it. Just as a quick look, uh, attached store doesn't have anything meaningful. Local store by sequence. So by sequence will show you every time you add something new to the database in that sequence that you added it. Underneath that, we've got document ID revision. So that will show you in reverse order. What was the last, in this case reverse, but what was the last thing we added or changed to the database? So another way to look at the data. Detect blob support, never mind. Document store. Um, another way to look at things, 01 key. So here's where I can look at it via key. So if I add a brand new class, CRN222, Android one campus add class. This doesn't update automatically. I have to refresh it. There's the key, 222. Two, two. And its value is all in here. That's another way to look at it via document store. You want to see it literally as the key and value. There is key value. And value is everything inside it plus extra stuff. There's, uh, there's the idea again. Um, the actual data is in data, and you've got this other stuff hasn't been deleted. But, but this seems like uh, it, it could be on the top or, or, or the last, but then it's right in the middle. It seems like it's, it's trying to, I don't know, what do you call it? it uh, in this case, it is um, organizing it. So if I put here zero, So in this view, it does display it in alphabetical order. Uh, the, I, I would say the truest way to look at it, however, is the sequence. Because this is, if you look at it this way, this is how it is being added to the database. But it almost doesn't matter, because we have operations to pull any record out of the database, display it in any order we want, filter it, and so forth. So I kind of like to look at it in sequence because it's in sequence. But if you look at it in a document store, we can see it quickly there alphabetically. So the user local meta store attachment store. So usually we'll be looking at by sequence or document store by sequence. I've added I've added four items to the database in my case. Zero, one, two, three. Let's continue to work on the functionality of this because look at this. Uh, I'm going to add another another class. Uh, let's say class one one one. That's English. Instructor Smith, add class. Okay, so it's it's giving me add it to database. Okay, it's getting annoying, but it's working. And now look at this. If I were to try to add CRN one 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 Spanish. Instructor Ortega, add class, JavaScript alert, status 409, name, conflict, message, document update, conflict. So what I've done is I've triggered on purpose the second possibility here. I've got if result or else error. Every time we are able to add something to the database correctly, we get the result which was right here, pop up, add it to B. Or else there must have been some kind of error. So then else is triggered. And I'm saying alert, show me that error. So one way to trigger that for yourself, add 
add a CRN that already exists, or try to add a CRN that already exists. Use a CRN that already exists, and if you put title and instructor different, doesn't matter. CRN is the one that's unique, is the one that it cares about in the database that only one exists. Just like when you try to create an account on a website and it asks you for an email, and you've already used your email, that email it says this already exists, choose another email. So then you get this pop-up, which we, we that's our alert, and we said show me that error. And it basically shows you a JSON formatted object. The error is a JSON formatted object, curly braces, key value, comma, key value, comma. Status 409 main conflict message document update conflict. Um, what's built in is what it's showing us. So, so the way that this is showing us, that's built into Pouch. Pouch is going to show us results, oftentimes in JSON format. So as we read the documentation, we get all these examples and such. If we wanted to put a customized message in there about the error, like, um, check your data, check your entry, and try again. Let me answer that question in one moment. Okay. We're going to see examples in the documentation. Example response here. A JSON object with OK ID revision. Key value, key value, key value. So we can put then our own custom errors here, because look at this. Uh, I'm going to show this again. Add class. Status 409. I can look up in uh, the pouch documentation a list of all error codes. So then I can check. If it's error, co error code 409, make it display this. If it's error 404, make it display that. So once I know the error code numbers, which I can look up on pouch.com, then I can craft my own uh, meaningful uh, pop-up. What we could do, let me just confirm this, uh, we can say dot message. I've got class 111. I know that one exists. Add class document update conflict. So notice what I did here. 42. We have you have alert. But I change it to alert.message. The documentation tells us, and I can see it. I can see it here. The response from pouch is status name message. So error.status will show me. 412. Error.name will show me missing ID. Error.message will show me ID is required for puts. There's another one, 412. So 408 was that you're trying to add a, an item to the database that is the same as another one. 412 is, well, you're trying to create an object with no ID. And so perhaps a better alert here is that error dot message don't show me that don't show the user all that other weird stuff they're not going to know error 414 what's that but error dot message that'll pop up and it's not always very user friendly it's more developer friendly but this is good enough here let's try this let's change your line 42 change that to error dot message save it and run it don't put anything in any of the boxes and click add class that's a possible error as well. Why are you trying to add data? Why are you trying to add empty data to the database? That's an error for pouch. If you try to add an ID, a CRN that already exists, that's another kind of error. There's other errors that we can also trigger. But here it'll just only show that uh, that value of this key, the message key as part of the error. JSON object.
people that aren't too curious, what about that? If error is going to give me back a JSON object with a bunch of interesting info, does the result do the same? So let's try that. Change line 40. Instead of having that friendly message, just to see what it does. Alert result. So if I run this, I will add a class, class 777, that's um, how to lottery, instructor, Akira, add class. Yeah, not that meaningful, object, object. If I try to add class 777 again, title, um, Social media, Jones, add class, document update conflict. I believe we can get some more meaningful results from that, but console. Yeah, the only thing that comes from it is ID, OK, and Rev. So um, nothing that meaningful, but we could do that. Result Rev, and then we'll freak out the users because what we'll get is the this pop up with some weird numbers, which they will think is an error. Anyway, um, I'm going to com comment out that alert. We don't need an obvious alert popping up every time. That's just for our testing purposes. Um, instead, what we're going to do is, OK, it seems that we're able to put stuff into the database. Let's do a little bit of user experience, a little bit of UX work, meaning, OK, I've, uh, the user is able to add stuff to the database, but what else should we do? We should clear those fields. We don't want the user to accidentally try to add the class again. So we've got that function. Clear fields. That's why we designed that, to clear those fields after the person adds in the, the class. So let's say, um, if you've got it like mine, on line 42, this is inside of the result inside of the if. If result. If we got a positive result, add clear fields function. Next line. We've also got a placeholder on screen, don't we? We've got a placeholder div. Why don't we give the user some feedback there? So we'll say dollar sign Found the, the result. Dot HTML quotes. No, actually, dot text. We're going to display some text in that div. Class added. So here what I'm trying to do is 
we're adding the class. If we do add the class, clear the fields so that they don't try to add the same class again. And then in the placeholder, display the text, class added. Okay, little mistake here. Uh, line 24. Let's instead de delete or comment out line 24. Class form dot reset. We should more use a long form of it. Document dot get element by ID quotes class form. No pound sign there because we mentioned ID here. We have pound sign here because via the jQuery we can use the shorthand. We need to do the longhand version. So document.getElementById classform.reset. Comment or delete that. So I mean if you keep reading it, I mean I mean it seems like it it, it worked, right? The it the creating it, it didn't it didn't for me actually I was getting it did? It didn't work for me. Yeah, it huh. And everyone's using Chrome? Well, uh, okay. If if you did clear your form, then uh now I'm getting uh import typer line twenty five. Well, that's just you need to make sure you've spelled it right. Get element capital E, capital B, capital I. Not capital. Yeah, that's always confusing. It's just capital I. <clears throat> now, uh, I was trying to do it the jQuery way, but because we're dealing with a form, it might not have done as <clears throat> how I was thinking of. So if it worked for you, if it did clear your, your fields, then don't worry about line 25. But for me, it didn't, so I did it the longhand version. And then it reset it. Okay, so what it's supposed to do, hopefully, is that you put in a value, class 999, um, that's uh, SEO, instructor Adams, add class, you get text at the bottom, class added, and the field's clear. So that's working or should work through 
line 45, add that text to the div value. Which div? The result div. And then clear fields right above it, clear fields, I backed up and changed it. Some of you seem to say you didn't need to, but I backed up to line 24 and I commented out the way I showed there, and instead I wrote it for long form, and then it worked. Clear the field. Clears the field. See, I put in anything here, add class, it cleared the fields, all three of them. If I look in my database, I've put in a bunch more data. All of this data. Anyone need any help? There's a couple of places where the problem could be, so let me try this trick here. I'm going to clone the view. So on the left is one place and on the right is the other. Line 24 and line 44. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, we've got uh, one one more little thing to do, and then we'll go for some lab time. If you've got it, in it if you've got it to work at, up to this point, we're seeing that as we add stuff to the 
database and it works, you get the pop-up at the bottom that says added class. And at the moment, if you if it doesn't work, we get we get that kind of alert. Well, we might as well use that div that's down here as well, this placeholder div to display the, that message instead of a big obtrusive pop-up. So getting back to our put command and our if else, we've got the il the, el the, re the result part, the if part, the positive result, uh, we cleared the fields on screen, we showed that text. So on else, I'm going to comment out that alert because instead we're going to use, so on line 46, comment out the alert and uh, we want to clear the fields again. We don't want those fields to be uh, to be filled in because one of the things that that would have been the negative result is that you're trying to fill in the same field uh, you're trying to use the same CRN again. So we'll do clear fields function. So that'll just empty out the boxes so they can try again. But instead, in that div, so this is, this is going to reuse the div. We've got that div waiting for us called the result. We're going to reuse it, dot text, and we'll make it display. Let's see, dot text. And uh, we can make it display the error dot message. That error message that Pouch gives us back instead of a pop-up, we'll just have it display in that, uh, that div. So try that. Save it and run it. Don't put anything into the fields and try to add a class. You should then see some text that appears below that error message. Let's see, so I won't put anything in, I'll add class. There you go, ID is required for puts. That particular error message might not be the best to show the user. They might say, what, what's an ID and what's a puts? Puts, that's wrong, that's wrong English. So um, it's not foolproof to do the, the error.message because it's a little bit more for the developer, for the programmers to, to see those error messages. But uh, with more effort, I could do some more coding where I could do something about, well, if this particular message appears, then maybe display a more user-friendly message. So we'll, um, we'll end at this point. We're able to add stuff to the database we uh, we want to show the classes on screen next time. Right now we can see that we've got data by looking at the console, but uh, of course I want to display this on screen for the user, and we'll we'll do that next time. That's going to require some more coding to pull the data out of the database and then display it on screen in a table. This will be great for a table because a table has rows and columns, so we'll have a row for this class and a row for that class and a column of the instructor and a column of the ID and so forth. So we'll do that next time. I'm going to save my work here. I'm going to put a copy of it in the network folder in case you want a copy of it. When we come back next time, we'll further do that. Any general questions? Yeah. You must say that CRM is always supposed to be numeric. Mm -hmm. It just goes out numeric. Is there a way to make uh, make it so so that it will only accept numerics in that field? Yeah, if we back up to line uh, twelve, we've got input type text. If we put that to number, uh, 
it'll only take numbers. Now, that's not foolproof on a web browser, but when it's on a mobile device, it does follow that better. On a mobile device, it should then only display your numeric keyboard, not the alphanumeric keyboard. On the web browser, it might not. Let me actually look at it. So I put number there. You know, it is going to let me type letters, but it's the web browser. Um, but when we get it... Oh, good point. Let's see. Yeah. Um, so it's not foolproof, but adding it as type number, and I know that on mobile devices, it will then force only the numeric keypad. On the web, we'd have to do some extra stuff, uh, some more complex stuff to, to test for good input, you know, checking regular expressions and such. But that's part of the whole user interface design. And remember what we said, uh, we, can't make any, we can't make everything foolproof because there's so many ingenious fools. Yes? When the database is created, it's created as part of the, in part of the browser's environment, so it's the, the, the database is, is available until you, until you clear it out using uh, some sort of a, a, a utility program, or when would the database, because if you get, if you get off your session, I assume it's saved, right? Yeah, so this web browser right here, if I close it completely, mm -hmm. if it was a variable, yeah. it would go away. But I closed it, and if I pull it back up, it's just a brand new session. You know, I'm, I'm clearly not on the it's website. Creating, it's actually saving, saving that in a, a disk area that's owned by the browser itself. Or, yeah. yeah, basically in the browser. Yeah. Is it saved in the cookies? It's you can think of you can think about it as as cookies um, somewhere within the temporary files of the Chrome web browser deep in there somewhere there is a location where it's being saved to. Um, so it's not permanent data. It's it's only for a limited amount of time. So whenever you clear your browser's temporary files, right? Yes. So if you do clear out all of those files, then it does go away. Now, thinking further ahead when it's going to be an app, well, what would happen? They'd have to uninstall the app. If they uninstall the app, then they lose all the data, like a regular app. If I have some app that does not have online abilities and I delete the app, I deleted all my data. So that's when we've got the ability to replicate to put it onto a more permanent server. But in our case, because we're just dealing with it as a web, as a web project, then it does, it is a little more fragile, but but basically it is Say that again? It's kind of like instead of us putting it up on the cloud the way that it, it would back up the data, it's just being in the temporary files so they kind of like prove of content, I guess. Well, because we might be more advanced users and we know about clearing our cache and all of that stuff, for us it might, it might feel like, well, it's not really permanent. But for most people that never clear out their browsers and just keep using their computers, it's pretty permanent for all intents and purposes. Uh, so, it's pros and cons. We're going to be creating, it, is it going to be stored within the browser area or within our app? Um, within, the app, within the app, the app itself. If we pull up the app information, mm -hmm. it will say the day it, how much data it has. The database will actually be in the app. Itself. It will be in the app. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other general questions? All right, then that's it for this week. When we come back next time, we will keep adding to this project. Mm -hmm.